generous on the eating table as well. You know, it's the only month where you're not supposed to be eating during daylight hours, but we have stored in our fridges and kitchens more food than we have for the other 11 months. Have you noticed that? I mean, two weeks before Ramadan, already your freezers are full, everything's arranged, you've got all your savouries, everything that's the most unhealthy of foods already packed away, and everything's waiting. Come on, come on, come on. My brothers, my sisters, calm down. It's a month where you should eat a little bit less, mashallah. It's supposed to bring about good health. It's not a month where I missed breakfast, I missed lunch, now for supper I'm going to have breakfast and lunch and supper. That's what some people do. Have you seen them? Subhanallah. Have you seen what happens? MashaAllah. Sometimes people think that if I miss Fajr and Thor, I need to make it when I'm making my Asr. So I start to put Fajr, Thor and Asr. Same rule applies. I missed my breakfast and lunch. Now I need to have my breakfast and lunch before I have my supper, dinner. May Allah forgive us. That's not how it should be. Have you noticed how sometimes we forget that the way the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has broken his fast at the end of the day was very simple. If we stick to that simplicity, it will bring about improvement in our health. Look at the dates. Ramadan is a month of dates. Do you agree? Ramadan is a month of dates. All of you have dates at home. Am I right? There goes. Ramadan is a month of dates. You have a date. A date with what? A date, okay, let's talk about having a date at the time of iftar, where you put in the date, it is rich in iron, it is very nutritious, it's a superfood, it's something you can survive on, dates and water, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has spoken about it, you have a date or two and you have water, so it's a month of dates, similarly you have a date with your prayer in the evening, you have a date with your five daily prayers, which means you make sure you meet them, you make sure you interact with them, you make sure you have the correct relationship with them, you make sure you make peace with them, and you make sure you fall in love with them. So you have a date with your prayers, you have a date with your dressing correctly, you have a date with the Almighty every single day, you have a date, subhanAllah, with the Quran where you need to read it. It's the month of the Quran. <laughs> The month of Ramadan in which the Quran was revealed. So Allah Almighty wants you to have a connection. I'm calling it here this evening a date with the Quran, right? You need to have a date with the Quran, a date with the remembrance of Allah, a date with truthfulness, a date with your children, your family members, your brothers, your sisters, a date with mending ties that are broken in your own families, a date with reaching out to the poor, reaching out to those of Whatever faith they may be in humanitarian causes, that which concerns all of us. Today we are seated here. I'm sure there are people from different faiths in our midst. They are our brothers and sisters here to listen to a good word about what Ramadan is all about. And that's why we're talking to everyone. And I really want to take this opportunity again to thank the Qatar, this beautiful venue, this beautiful place that has really made it, well, they have made it available for us. And it's amazing. It's such a beautiful event. May Allah Almighty grant goodness to everyone who made this possible. You know, they call it the Qatar Public Diplomacy. It's an amazing place. And I think, look at the weather. We thank Allah for it. Look at the, the crowd. We thank Allah we were able to gather. MashaAllah, the Ministry of Awqaf and the brothers at the Ibn Zayd Center have made this possible. And all of you have come here and we were all looking forward to this. Here we are talking about what? Ramadan, my brothers, my sisters, we reach out to one another to empower each other in the right direction. We empower each other. If what I've said this evening will not move you to improve yourself even an inch, then we've wasted our time. But if we got together, we felt in our hearts that, look, I need to do something to make myself a better person, no matter who I am, and to reach out to those in need, then definitely we've achieved a lot. There are people right now, as we speak, 
struggling across the globe in different ways. Some are homeless, some don't have food and drink, some are struggling because of warfare, some are struggling because of natural disaster, some are struggling because of oppression. How have you reached out to them is a question that every single human being must ask himself or herself if they have an iota of faith in the Almighty. And the minimum reaching out is through a prayer. Oh Allah, grant them ease. And that's why I seize this opportunity again to say, Oh Allah, whoever is struggling in whatever way they are struggling across the globe, including the struggles of every single one of us seated here, make easy for each one in their unique circumstances, whatever they are going through in terms of difficulty, create ease for them, solve their problems. I mean, that's the minimum as a Muslim. It's the minimum that you owe people across the globe. Do you care for them? Now, what is the connection you might ask? Why should I bother? Those people are a different nationality. Those are a different race. Those belong to a different faith, etc. What's the common factor here? The common factor is the fact that the maker who made you, whom you are trying to please, actually made them too. Whether you like it or not, whether you're, they are your friends or your enemies, the one who made you made them. If he didn't want, he wouldn't have done that. But he made them as a test for you and for them. Subhanallah, as simple as that. Whoever made me and I'm trying to please him, what is Islam all about? Islam is all about worshipping the deity who made you. That's it. Whoever made me, I put my head on the ground for him. That's all. That's what Islam is all about. I submit unto he who made me. No one else. Now, if I'm trying to please him because I believe my life is in his hands, my death is in his hands, my paradise in his, is in his hands, and I want paradise, he will give it to me. I need to please him. And if I want to please him, anything that is dear to him is dear to me. Anything he has made, I will respect it, and I will fulfill its rights, even if it is an animal. Even if it is an animal, even if it is a plant, the ecosystem, the ocean, the water, whatever else it may be. Why are we as Muslims supposed to be concerned about preservation of the environment? Why are we as Muslims supposed to be concerned about the ecosystem? It is because we believe the one who made us made all of that and he wants us to please him. And if we're going to please him and we want his pleasure, we need to look after whatever else he has made. As simple as that. Similarly, as human beings, there is one step higher, and that is we're all children of the same Adam and the same Eve, the same Adam and the same Hawa in the Arabic language, may peace be upon them. So, like you have children today, you might have two children, five children. May Allah bless those who don't have children with children. I mean, and may Allah bless those who have children, that the children become the coolness of their eyes. I mean. Let's say you have a few children, 15, 20, 30 generations down, there will be tens of thousands from those few that you've had, all were your children. One day on the day of judgment, you will see them. You will see people generations down, and when you are asked, or when you ask, who are they, they'll say, this is, these are all your progeny. Wow, me, imagine Adam. Adam may peace be upon him. He was Abul Bashar. He was the father of all the human species. Imagine one day when he sees billions and trillions and quadrillions of people. Who are these? They're all your children. Oh, wow. Wow. Subhanallah. Normally when you travel to some places, they ask, how many children do you have? You say two. They say five. Someone says ten. Oh, it sounds like a big number. And then you get this guy saying, I have twenty children. Sorry, how many? I have 20, 20, mashallah, tabarakallah. You've got to make the tabarakallah loud because you know you don't want your eye to affect them, you know. So you say, mashallah, tabarakallah, you know. That means whatever Allah has willed, alhamdulillah, it's a nice thing. But 20, yes, it's a lot for today, you know. People, subhanallah, will tell you, alhamdulillah, it's so much. Imagine you see your progeny and your offspring, and among them, they are fighting and killing each other. Is it going to make you happy or sad? Your own children, you're going to call them and say, listen, you guys, no matter what the problem is, sort your matter. Sort your matter. That's what it should be. Do not do this. That's what you would say as a parent, subhanAllah. Now, my brothers and sisters, this happens in humankind where we tend to forget that we're all part of one broader family. We 
will be different. We are different. We were created different. We will have different thinking, mentalities, different faiths, different inclinations, so much of differences. But it's the month of Ramadan, for example, that should highlight the fact that we are all part and parcel of one species. We are part of one huge family. We respectfully may disagree, but we will not intentionally cause harm to one another. In fact, we will reach out to one another to save lives of whoever's life is in danger. The Quran speaks about it when it says, وَمَنْ أَحْيَاهَا فَكَأَنَّمَا أَحْيَا النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا Whoever saves a single soul, a single person, without mentioning what faith they belong to, what race they are, whatever else, all that is irrelevant. If you save a single human being, it is as though you've saved humanity at large. That's what the Quran says. And if you cause the death of us one person, if you've murdered a single person, it's as though you've murdered entire humanity. That's what the Quran says. Now, why do I say Ramadan highlights all of this? Because the compassion that is taught in the month of Ramadan to be able to give, to reach out, the reward is multiplied. Imagine that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says, if you have assisted a person in iftar, in breaking the fast at the end of the day, you will have a full reward of their fast as well. That's why you have people inviting you for iftar. Please come in, come in for iftar. We will have iftar in some of the mosques and some of the other places, depending different cultures in different countries. But they have these tables laid with beautiful iftar and they're inviting everyone. You know why? For that reason. The reason is if you give someone a date to open their fast and you give them that first meal as they fasted, you achieve the full reward of the entire fast of that person together with your own. May Allah grant us ease. Why would Allah give so much of importance to that? He wants you to reach out to others. He wants you to find out more about them. You know, in Islam, we have a beautiful teaching known as Jumu'ah and Jama'ah. Jumu'ah means the Friday, the gathering on the Friday for prayers. And we have Jama'ah meaning the daily congregational prayers. We believe that it should be done in the masjid, in the mosque, as to the best of your abilities, unless you have an excuse. Why? There are many reasons. One of them is to be able to meet each other, interact, find out what's happening in each other's lives in terms of negativity and reach out to them to make it positive. If you miss somebody one day, you should be asking what's wrong, is the brother okay, you know, and so on. Is the sister fine? And if the people are not doing too well, you should reach out to them, visit them perhaps, see what they need. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says, if you meet the need of another, the Almighty will continue to meet your needs for as long as you're occupied in meeting the needs of others. Imagine how beautiful the teaching is. So we reach out to the poor. We are charitable. The food and the drink, not just around us, but the circle becomes broader and broader and broader. And so we give. Ramadan is a month of giving. You will notice a lot of giving. Your fast is not accepted at the end of the month as a Muslim unless you've given out a certain amount or a certain amount of food at the end of the month known as Sadatatul Fitr. Are you aware of that? The Fitr. So what that means, it's equivalent to approximately a few kilos of dates. Maybe perhaps here in this country, it might be about 20 or 25, 30 riyal. I'm not too sure exactly what the figure is. But maybe even less. You have to give a certain amount of grain, certain amount of food stuff, food item to the poor. At the end of Ramadan, you have to. If there are two billion Muslims on earth, the two billion have to give it, subhanAllah. And the poor people, if they get more than what they actually need, they should give from that to someone else. That's when your fasting is accepted. The plug-in happens at the end of Ramadan when you give the Sadaqatul Fitr.